Praise God. Good evening, everyone. We give God praise for another time to come around his word. We give God glory for studying in the book of Revelation, a book I have now come to call Glorious and a book of hope, one that has made me to rejoice and to give him praise and glory. All right. Um, I want to give God thanks for all those who take time out to listen. Thank God also for all the helps to make this happen and the advice to make this of uh, quality that we can work with. Remember also by next week, God's willing, I expect to wrap up the book of Revelation and then go into a study on conflict management, which I think is a very important one also. And then also I'm working on making you get the material via YouTube so that it can be less stressful on your uh, devices. It doesn't mean we won't go with the WhatsApp. We will still do that. So we give God praise and glory. Hallelujah. I'm going to be reading from Revelation 22, 6 to 10. That's a part of the text we read last week because I feel like I need to pick up from where we left off last week. All right. So from verse 6, he said unto me, these things, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the saying of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See that thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the saying of this book, Worship God. Worship God. Then verse 10. And he said unto me, Seal not the saying of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Father, we worship and adore you today. We thank you for the hope in your word. Thank you, God, for your blessings. And I welcome your Holy Spirit to minister through me and to anoint the ear of your people to hear and to understand. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Praise God. Let us start where... We left off last week. As a matter of fact, I want to share with you again from J.B. Smith, the writer of the book, A Revelation of Jesus Christ. I believe he has given us a very beautiful description of what we have just gone through, the new Jerusalem. Praise God. He said, he said and there shall be no more curse, perfect restoration. The throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it perfect administration the servants shall serve him which is perfect subordination they shall see his face perfect transformation his name shall be in their forehead perfect identification there shall be no night there and there shall be no need for the candle nor the light of the sun for the Lord giveth them light which is perfect illumination. And then they shall reign forever and forever, which is perfect exaltation. Isn't that wonderful? I love it. I love it and I trust that you do also. But um, we shall, through experience, one writer says, understand that the suffering of this earth is not worthy to be compared with the glory we will enjoy according to Romans 8 and verse 18. Romans 8 and verse 18 says, I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Praise the name of the Lord. We need to anticipate. We need to look forward to great things from the hand of God while we go through stuff here in serving him. Warren Weasby put it this way, heaven is more than a destination for the child of God. It is a motivation. So let us check, does 
Does it motivate you as we go through this study? I know somebody said to me last week, um, I look like I really want to do this study. I said, listen, there's a difference in teaching tribulation than teaching the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem brings joy. It brings rejoicing. It should be a motivation. Knowing that we shall dwell in the heavenly city ought to make a difference in our lives here and now. I'm still reading from Weasby. The vision of the heavenly city motivated the patriarchs and they walked with God and served him. Then knowing, speaking of Jesus Christ now, knowing that he was returning to the Father in heaven also encouraged him to face the cross. The Bible said he endured the cross and he despised the shame because he understood the joy that was set before him. Glory be to God. The assurance of heaven must not lull us into complacency or carelessness, but, but it should spur us to fulfill our spiritual duties. That's what it should be. The next area I want to share with you is where John tells us, they not lull us into complacency or carelessness, but, but it should spur us to fulfill our spiritual duties. That's what it should be. The next area I want to share with you is where John tells us the, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. The angel that was talking to John told him that. And here he sends it to us. Why is this so important? There are those who try to make our faith abstract. Here one of our famous singers say, uh, If you want to know what life is worth, you need to seek yours here on earth. Well, look here. How many people try to seek theirs here on earth and what they get? Oh, sometimes I know people just as they begin to excel, then comes in death. Just as they begin to move, then sometimes disaster. All kind of things beset us. Now, don't get me wrong. We need to pursue the best that God has in store for us. But life has a way to bring some issues. You can't build it here on earth uh, because earth shows us all kinds of things. But here, John is showing us that our faith has foundation. Because the same spirit of the Old Testament prophets that we see fulfilled in the word of God and some of the things we see still playing out are a demonstration that when God speaks, it is coming to pass. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, when we look at it, we see from Genesis, Jesus was spoken of as the seed of the woman. Long before the angel came and announced that the virgin shall be with child and bring forth a son. <laughs> he was seen as the animal slain in, in, in both Genesis and Exodus for the redemption of God's people. When Jesus was coming, John said, Behold the Lamb of God. He takes away the sins of the world. They understood because this was already shown as a type of that animal killed to deliver Israel out of Egypt. We see Isaiah himself also laying out the life of Jesus Christ hundreds of years before, and we see it come to pass. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, he said, He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed, and all of those stuff. And then in, in the further, he shows of his resurrection and have his glorious life afterward. He said, verse 10, But it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. But guess what? He shall see his seeds, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Listen, that, that is not speaking to the death. That is speaking to beyond the death, that God 
is going to bring him back and he's going to see all that he's supposed to see. So the spirit of the prophecy of the Old Testament, as we see them fulfilled, is also showing us that we are not just having a faith that is floating in the air. It has foundation in fulfillment and we are to believe God. Now, as it pertains to resurrection, which is also an important part of the, of the hope of the church, Paul himself had to speak to, um, to people on this and, and use agriculture and, and creation to show that, listen to me, your faith has foundation. When he speak of resurrection, he said um, in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 35, he said, but some will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? That is critics and skeptics. But John addressed them. He said, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it dies. He was using agriculture to demonstrate that, listen, God is doing it in your very face. And he, God has no problem with resurrection. He said, and that which thou sowest, thou, thou sowest not the body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God gives it a body as it hath pleased him. And to every seed, God has given it its own body. All flesh are not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of fish, another of birds. He's showing again that when God speaks of eternal bodies, he is able to do it. And it is logical to believe God that he is coming through. Look, there, he said there are celestial bodies and there are terrestrial bodies, bodies. Bodies in the heavenlies and bodies on earth. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the ter terrestrial is the other. He said there is one glory of the sun, another of the moon and another of the stars. Look at it. God has this sun burning for a long time. But it has not burnt out. <laughs> Come on, we serve an awesome God. We serve an awesome God. And he says, so it's another of the stars and one star different from another. Okay, so John was basically tell him, telling them, look here, it's before you. Your faith has foundation, even in logics, in farming, in, in creation, but also in prophecy. All right, we need to believe God because God is not soft. He's able to do more than we can imagine. Praise God. The other area that I want us to look on is in verse 7. Where we see John writes Jesus' message. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. There are those who are critical of this area. And there are those who try just to explain it away, so to speak by saying it means suddenly but i understand that the greek word here means soon or in short time so uh in human term we say how he has not been here yet the church has always been told to keep looking for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to remember two things. And I'm going to read from 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, 8 and 9. It says, Beloved, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. What is Peter saying here? God's timing and our timing are not the same. We have to understand that. A thousand years are with uh, God as one day. And one day as a thousand years. So what we call a short time doesn't necessarily mean a short time with God. But we are encouraged to be watchful and to look for the Lord's return. Then verse 9 says, 
The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What is Peter saying again? God doesn't rush also because he gives time for man to repent. Only thing man uses God's long suffering to do other things and to judge him in another way. But here it is saying God is not procrastinating the second return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But would that men repent? Let me just say something on that again also because as we are dealing with the virus, I keep remembering what the word of God says in Revelation, I think it's in chapter 9, that even when the plagues of the tribulation come upon man, they will not repent. And we are seeing it playing out. Science is important and all the other stuff. We look forward to vaccine and all of those. We look forward to them. But so many have gone in this and are still struggling and it's still climbing. We need to understand that we need to turn our lives to the Lord in a fullsome way. Because man, have, man has a way to explain away everything. But we need to look to God. And that will be the issue. We can explain it away. We can explain it away. And not realizing that the word of God says there's coming a day. When we are going to face the tribulation and that is not for the church no that is for those who um, will not go with jesus christ another area that we want to look on is that john attempted to worship the angel john attempted to worship the angel when john saw no doubt the glory sitting on that angel that brought the message John fell on his knees to give worship to the angel. The angel said, no, I'm your fellow servant. And that's interesting. We are not here to worship angels. Anywhere you go and see angels are being worshipped and glorified, you don't need to stay there. The Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, worship God, worship God. Amen. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit comes to help us to lift up Jesus Christ. So let us not miss it. The angel said, no, don't worship me. Worship God. Now we need to ask ourselves the question, how many times have we really given the glory where it belongs in our achievements, in our blessings, in our favors that we receive? How many times have we really taken it when we should have passed it on to God? How many times have we directed the glory to God? I listened to Bishop Grant dealing with this so beautifully in the book of Daniel. Let us not do our work, our ministry, our work in the church for the glory. We know we want God's favor. We want to see God's blessing upon our lives. But let us keep passing glory unto God. Amen. Or else, when you don't get that glory that you aspire for, and all of us want to be appreciated and so on, but when you don't get the glory, if that's what you go for, then you will drop hands when it doesn't happen. When people even lift up others and don't lift you up in this, in this time of ministry or whatever you do in your local church. Give the glory where it belongs in our achievements, in our blessings, in our favors that we receive. How many times have we really taken it when we should have passed it on to God? How many times have we directed the glory to God? I listened to Bishop Grant dealing with this so beautifully in the book of Daniel. Let us not do our work, our ministry, our work in the church for the glory. 
We know we want God's favor. We want to see God's blessing upon our lives. But let us keep passing glory unto God. Amen. Or else, when you don't get that glory that you aspire for, and all of us want to be appreciated and so on, but when you don't get the glory, if that's what you go for, then you will drop hands when it doesn't happen. When people even lift up others and don't lift you up in this, in this time of ministry or whatever you do in your local church. Give the glory to God and expect God to give you the reward. The angel said, worship God. And they have said it before. It's not the beast to be worshipped. Worship God. The final area that I want us to look on is where John was told not to seal up this book. Don't seal this one up. While Daniel was told to seal up his book. Two, two different approach. Daniel was told by God, seal up the book because it's for a time. It's, it's, it's for way down the road. That's Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. Look at it. Daniel was told to seal up the book to the time of the end. John was told not to seal up his book. That is speaking to the fact that we are in the time of the unfolding. Listen to what God said to Daniel. And at the time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble. Listen, that's Daniel speaking. There shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone shall be found everyone that shall be found written in the book notice even though daniel was told to seal up the book for the end we are getting a peak even of revelation even though daniel had to seal up speaking of the book we talk about the book of life that is again showing the spirit of the prophet now verse 2 and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt given to, 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 to Daniel but he was to seal it up because the end is not yet uh, verse 3 and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the star forever and ever we have looked at that already also but look at verse 4 it says but thou O Daniel shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end then he said many shall go to and fro many shall go to and fro in other words he was dealing with the matter of travel also even now what are we seeing we are seeing travel as never before as a matter of fact the world is trying to stop people now from travel just because of coronavirus and at the same time, millions are still flooding the airports. People can't wait for things to reopen. Cars are on the street heading from one place to the other. Why? We are in the age of travel. And also, we were told knowledge will increase. They will go to and fro and then knowledge will increase. We need to ask ourselves the question, are we really paying attention to what is around us? Are we really saying, I want my life to be in the will of God? Daniel ended up by saying, men will go to and fro and knowledge will increase. Seal it up, but we still get a peak. No, Daniel, um, John unfolds it. As a matter of fact, John has not even spoken about the time of travel. 
But Daniel spoke about it. The spirit of the prophet again. When we see the spirit of the prophet fulfill, it's an assurance that, listen, what God says in John will come to pass. Now, look at knowledge. Knowledge has increased in the last hundred years more than any other of the thousands of years before. Knowledge will increase. Look at your cell phone. Technology is shifting by the minute. Let us keep our hearts and our minds stayed on the Lord. John did not seal up. It's unfolding. It's unfolding. And let us keep our hearts and our minds stayed on the Lord. Look for the blessed hope. While we work here on earth, look for 